Carnegie Mellon, as you know, is dedicated to contributing to the implementation of Qatar's national vision for 2030. And we see ourselves as working collaboratively with each of you, our friends and our colleagues in the audience tonight, to implement the four interrelated pillars of human, social, economic, and environmental development. Our commitment to work with you in these areas is explicitly articulated in Carnegie Mellon's mission statement, which was endorsed by our Board of Trustees in 2008. To create and disseminate knowledge and art through research and creative inquiry, teaching and learning, and to transfer our intellectual and artistic product to enhance society in meaningful and sustainable ways. And to serve our students by teaching them problem solving, leadership, and teamwork skills, and the value of a commitment to quality, ethical behavior, and respect for others. Furthermore, we recognize and we cherish our interdependence with the region. As members of Qatar society, and as your neighbors since 2004, we are delighted that we have been and continue to be able to contribute to the community and the region through the good efforts of the 103 graduates in business administration, computer science, or information systems who have been our class of 2008, 2009, 2010, and through the continuing hard work of more than 275 young women and men who are currently enrolled with us as full-time students. We are particularly pleased to be able to share Pat Terenzini with you this evening. I'm not formally introducing Pat to you, but if you permit me, I'd like to just tell you one very, very brief story. I first became aware of his work when I read the article, Living with Myths, Undergraduate Education in America about 15 years ago. In this article, Pat and Ernie Pascarella summarized a body of research that served to refute common beliefs about higher education, such as traditional instructional methods provide proven ways to teach undergraduates, good teachers are good researchers, faculty members only influence students learning in the classroom, and so on. Ironically, I read this article shortly after I had returned to academia following 13 years away, uh, working in a Washington-based nonprofit organization. And I have to tell you that this article had a profound influence on my re-entry to higher education. So for me in particular, it's a distinct pleasure to be with you this evening, and my wife Ray and I look forward to an evening with Pat Taranzini. I now call upon Kevin Lamb, our Assistant Dean for uh, Planning, who will introduce Dr. Taranzini more formally. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. And good evening and welcome to all of you. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure and an honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Patrick Taranzini. Uh, and it's a long list of accomplishments. I've tried to crib it down a bit, but I, I want to share with you so you have a sense of the, the, the work, the body of work he's done. Uh, Dr. Terenzini is the Distinguished Professor of Higher Education and Senior Scientist Emeritus uh, in the Department of Education Policy Studies and the Center of Study of Higher Education at the Pennsylvania State University. His research examines the effects of college on student learning and development, persistence, and educational attainment. He has been the principal investigator and or the co-principal uh, investigator on research grants totaling more than $13 billion for such organizations as the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, the Lumina Foundation for Education, the Sloan Foundation, and the Spencer Foundation. We may all know Dr. Terezi's uh, uh, work uh, most for uh, what he has co-authored with uh, Ernest Pasquarella. It's a two-volume set how college affects students, 
It's an award-winning synthesis of over 30 years of research on the impacts of the college experience on students. The first volume was selected as, quote, one of the 100 most important and influential books about U.S. colleges and universities published in the 20th century, end quote. Dr. Terenzini has also published more than 130 uh, articles in refereed journals and made more than 250 presentations at scholarly and professional, national and international conferences. He is the former editor-in-chief of New Directions for Institutional Research, associate editor of Higher Education, Handbook of Theory and Research, and editorial board member for the Review of Higher Education. He's been a consulting editor for Research in Higher Education for 30 years. He has received numerous awards, uh, research awards, and most recently, Dr. Terenzini was named the first recipient of the Sphere of Influence Award, given jointly by the American College Personnel Association and the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. This is an award that's going to be given once every decade. And Dr. Terenzini is the first recipient of that award. I think the key challenge for, for, for Dr. Terenzini this evening is to share the lessons from this illustrious background with us here in our setting here at Cutter. Much of his, uh, his work has been done mostly in North America and how much of it can translate over and we're all looking very forward to, to hearing more about that. So please welcome Dr. Patrick Terenzini. generous introduction and Dick thank you for reading Living with Myths. It's always nice to know that somebody reads what you write <laughs> and it's even more gratifying to know they like what they read. Thank you. And good evening everyone. Asalaamu uh, Alaikum. Uh, It's a great honor for me to be here and a, and a distinct pleasure. And uh, there are a lot of people uh, that I'd like to acknowledge who, who made it possible, uh, not the least of whom is uh, Indira uh, Nair, the Vice Provost, uh, Associate Provost, excuse me, Emeritus at Carnegie Mellon, uh, whom I know only through phone conversations on a committee that we worked together before with the Associate, uh, American Society for Engineering Education. I also want to thank Dean Tucker uh, and the Committee for the Assessment of Student Learning and Development, um, whose idea I guess this was in the first place. So thank you for the, all for the vote of confidence. Um, I also want to thank Kevin Lamb uh, for uh, helping, helping me understand a little bit about Qatar and Education City and Carnegie Mellon. And Sean Sadler, who made it all happen, this is a thing that works, works wonders. I said to Kevin that if Carnegie Mellon and Qatar ever needs another income stream, that, uh, that Sean's skills uh, as, a, as a travel agent and, uh, and hospitality host, would, she's, she's marketable. Uh, also, Eleanor uh, I. Young and uh, Karen, uh, Karen Sonia, who uh, helped make all of the arrangements. I'm grateful to you all, and I know that an event like this takes, uh, takes a lot of time and energy. Uh, but I really welcome the opportunity to visit this region of the world. I've never been here before. Uh, with what I know, I know only from reading, but to, uh, to be here, uh, to see it uh, on the ground, as they say, and to learn not only more about Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar, but also Education City and, and Qatar as a nation. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is uh, review what we know about the effects of college on students uh, and consider some of the organizational and practical implications of that. My career, as Kevin outlined, has been spent studying the effects of, on, of college on students. And uh, that body of evidence tells us a good deal about how students learn and develop and change. Uh, it's also worth noting that we're not responsible for all of the changes that occur. And uh, that many that are associated with the college attendance, we take credit in some ways as institutions. We take credit, uh, far more credit than we deserve for what happens. But 
we also do make our own distinct and, uh, and non-trivial contributions, and I'll share some of those with you this evening. But a phone call from Ernie Pasquarello, who uh, sounded like the godfather and said, I got a, I got a, uh, I, uh, what's the phrase, I got a, um, I got an offer, thank you, an offer you can't refuse. And I should have known then that it was potentially in trouble, but the idea was to replicate a review of research that had been done by Ken Tallman and Theodore Newcomb uh, in 1967 that reviewed the first 40 years of the research on college students, and Ernie and I were both at a point in our careers where we realized that Bible literature was getting dated. Well, Tallman and Newcomb reviewed about, uh, I think it was, 1,500 articles and books and reports and so on. Uh, when Ernie and I came along to do the first volume of How College Affects Students, uh, we decided we would update it to the moment and that would cover 20 years. What we didn't know was that between 1970 and 1990, that number from Feldman and Newcomb from 1,500 had jumped to about 3,000. Uh, only 2,600 or so of which we, we actually uh, referenced at one point or another. When we, uh, well, you'd think we'd learned our lesson then and would uh, not try to do it again, but we, we decided we'd give it one more try, uh, thinking, well, a 10-year review will be a lot simpler. What we didn't know was that in 10 years, the volume of, the lit of literature was equal to what it had been in the previous 20. The curve was just going, going up exponentially. But I can assure you all that uh, Pascal and Terence won't be won't be doing this again. <laughs> and if you don't think that kind of the kind of work that uh, that goes into a volume like this takes its toll on people, um, just to give you an idea, this is this is what I looked like in 1985. <laughs> 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 and, uh, we can't work on that. So this, uh, <laughs> It does, it does take a toll, clearly, and this, this is Ernie uh, before and after. Uh, it's, it's awfully, painfully obvious how difficult this work is, and administrators sometimes I think underestimate the strain of serious scholarly work. In our book, we summarize that literature that responded to half a dozen questions, and you'll see them here and I won't try uh, for an instant to even begin to touch the whole surface. I want to concentrate on, uh, on number four uh, and that question about uh, what happens on particu any particular campus, the within college experiences that make a difference on how much students learn, how they learn it, and uh, whether they learn it at all. And I want to focus on that question B for a couple of reasons, the first of which is that deals with the sources of influence, of greatest influence. These are the, these are the areas of, of uh, greatest impact. And the second reason is that these are the things over which we as faculty members and administrators have some, uh, some kind of programmatic and pedagogical or policy, uh, policy control. These are the things that we can do something about. And we can talk about success and uh, benefits of college in a number of different ways, and both volumes uh, cover a lot of these outcomes. But this evening, I want to really try to do three things, the first of which is to review the findings and conclusions that we reach. But I want to concentrate less on, uh, on what influences, what particular influences are, are, are relevant or worth attention and more on the range of influences. I want, to, I want to give you some sense of the breadth of the kinds of experiences that students have, all of which to varying degrees, of course, but all of which have, have some measurable outcome. So how does college affect students? Um, and at the risk of a gross oversimplification, I want to summarize what we know as a fairly broad and conventional conventional categories. In this first one, uh, if you look at some of the central or foundational student experiences and how they relate to academic or cognitive learning outcomes. And among all of the things that happen, these are some of the ones that are the more influential. Now the baseline here, the reference point, uh, the comparison point, uh, is traditional lecture and discussion sections. So these, these 
the differences that these pedagogies make are relative uh, compared to what might happen to similar students in a similar classroom that's, that's dealt with pedagogically in a more conventional, traditional way. Now those percentile points at the end, think of those as percentile points on the ACT or SAT score, where if you start out, assume we might start at the 50th percentile, that's what would be the average for an average student in a traditional lecture discussion course or section. 15 percentile points higher is, in this case, uh, with supplemental instruction. It's where the same students might, uh, might perform under a different pedagogical regimen. That uh, really represent a transformation in the way we think about students and about student learning and teaching over the last now perhaps 20 years. But uh, use of common tasks, teamwork, uh, common tasks that are suitable for learning in small groups, uh, a shared independence of this, or uh, independence, dependence rather, of students on one another in the group and active learning, but the role of the faculty in the lecture is uh, the sage on the stage, and in active learning, the metaphor is the guide on the side. And uh, I have another contribution or a suggestion to make that perhaps with lecture and discussion, it may also be the bore on the floor. <laughs> and a couple of, po of important points. Uh, these are things that we know are effective in the classroom. We know, we know what constitutes good teaching. And these skills are, are teachable and they're learnable. Uh, so I think the real take home message from this, this evidence is that we probably can do better what we're already doing well. Uh, so it's, it's, we can take it, a, take it a step higher. If we look at the effects of the curriculum, we find, and there's less research in this area, but the, the curricular effects on, on the whole are greatest when the curriculum is interdisciplinary. And this is more than just the typical set of general education uh, distribution requirements. It's not simply taking six from column A and six from column B and three from column C, but there's a, a, a taking sets of courses that are paired together because they are substantively, intellectually, and otherwise interconnected, that they're integrated, and that the core itself is integrated. There's a purposeful awareness of what students, what we want our students to learn and understand, and how we can best, might best go about that. And that uh, these courses, the curriculum that, that emphasizes or makes explicit connections uh, across ideas, courses, and disciplines are, are more likely to be educationally effective than the simple choose from a menu, three from this section, five from that. And just note the underlying words here, that that's, those are the critical terms. But my basic point here is that students learn outside the classroom, and they learn some important and valuable <coughs> things. And they may uh, learn some of those things better outside the classroom, in fact, than they do inside. And some of those things include, uh, these are the kinds of experiences, multiple experiences related to multiple objects. And I'm going to run through this list quickly. But again, watch the range here. That each, one or more, each of these kinds of experiences is related to psychosocial changes, changes that may involve identity formation, self-concept, self-confidence, uh, self-esteem, and uh, personal independence, locus of control, sense of responsibility for one's fate or uh, what happens, sense of responsibility for interpersonal skills. They're associated with changes in social and political uh, orientations, activities, and community-oriented values, political orientations and activities, religious beliefs uh, and activities, community service involvement, changes in attitudes toward women and their roles in families and the workforce, changes in professional values and norms, um, changes in racial and ethnic uh, attitudes, changes in moral reasoning skills. Now, this is not changing one's moral beliefs, it's changing the ways in which one reaches conclusions about what constitutes moral behavior, right from wrong, and so on. It becomes 
it much more internalized uh, than it sometimes than it sometimes otherwise is. Among the most interesting, I think, uh, are some of these effects. Let me just back up for a minute here. That students out of class experiences also have important influences on their academic and cognitive development. That's, that's a, a fact, I think, that we've known for some time, but we frequently either ignore or overlook it. We can, we can promote students' intellectual development both inside and outside the classroom. And some of the uh, out-of-class experiences that make a difference in their academic and cognitive learning development shown here. Uh, quality of effort and the level of effort. Students must get involved here. The message is that it's not entirely the res responsibility of the faculty member for, that students learn they have to take some responsibility of their own, and it behooves us to help them understand that, that they have a role to play as well. Uh, their interactions with their peers, the effects are strongest when those contacts extend and reinforce other class-related experiences. The same applies to their contacts with faculty members. Frequency is less important than the quality of the content of their contacts. Intellectual and substantive contacts and discussions uh, are likely to be more effective um, than more casual, uh, informal conversations. But again, the greatest impact is when students' out-of-class contact reinforces or extends what's happening in the classroom. Now, something that's often forgotten, I think, overlooked, uh, particularly perhaps among the student affairs community and probably also among the faculty, the things that go on in the classroom not only have direct effects on, on what students learn and the kinds of skills they develop, but they also have effects on their development in other areas. You begin to get the sense, metaphorically, of a web that when you touch it in one place, it, that the impact is felt throughout the web, the web. The entire web responds to that. And the evidence suggests that the same thing is true with, uh, with individuals, that students' curricular and classroom experiences also contribute to changes in their psychosocial development, in their attitudes and values, and to their development of principle and moral reasoning. Some of, those, some of those activities are, are listed here. And again, one or more of the, notice the range, one or more of these activities is associated with identity formation and change, uh, the changes in self-concepts and self-confidence, interpersonal skills, and add such attitudinal and value changes as socio-political attitudes, civic community attitudes and values, racial ethnic attitudes, and so on. The list you begin to see also the, the kind of the list of uh, uh, the usual suspects, so to speak. But there's an interconnection. Uh, there's an interconnected system here that, that we're losing sight of. By focusing too narrowly on the trees, we're losing sight, losing sight of the forest and the interconnections among the parts, uh, the parts of, uh, of our educational system, whether, whether we recognize it or not and changes that occur, uh, both cognitive and psychosocial changes that occur oftentimes simultaneously. So, one of the conclusions, the first characters, if you, if you think back now about whether it's in the classroom, active and, active and collaborative learning, uh, hands-on learning, service learning, uh, an integrated curriculum, think about our class, their interactions with, with students and faculty, um, their engagement in various student activities. Uh, one of the characteristics they share is that they almost uniformly involve encounters with ideas uh, that are different from what students hold, political, religious, or social, uh, encounters with people who are different from them racially or uh, ethnically, culturally or national origin or uh, social economic status and so on. And the second characteristic is that they all require active, active student engagement with the different. 
a response to cognitive dissonance. Without cognitive dissonance, there's unlikely to be much change. Now, if the challenge is too great, this is the Goldilocks theory uh, in the three bears. If the challenge is too great, it will be dismissed. If it's too, too small uh, or too little, it'll be ignored. But if it's just about right, please don't ask me what that is, the student will realize that he or she needs to deal with it, can deal with it, and, and can succeed at it. And uh, that brings to the third characteristic that these encounters, these challenges, these encounters with a different uh, occur in a supportive environment where as part of the culture, the culture says it's okay to experience this. That's part of what learning is. Learning is not always comfortable. In fact, it oftentimes starts uh, with some degree of discomfort in recognizing that something just isn't quite right. Uh, it's more likely to occur in a, in a supportive than in a competitive environment where there's a sense of shared experience and the, the members of the community going through the same process share those experiences and help, help one another out. One of the background explanations or underlying explanations for the power of uh, peer tutoring, I think. But there are other ways in business, in a, in a business school, there can be ways where, where the elderly or the less well-educated can be helped under, to understand the tax code and prepare their, uh, prepare their returns. But with a little imagination and a little creativity, the kinds of things that we can stand up and lecture about in a classroom can be practiced in a real life where things matter in a real world setting and learn not only the tools of the trade, but learn something about the people with whom the students are, are getting engaged. Uh, fifth is that these, these high impact experiences, if, if you want to call them that, uh, generally provide relational or social experiences. More often than not, in these experiences, other people besides the individual student are involved. The others, the others involve maybe faculty members, other peers, anyone really, uh, maybe employers on part-time jobs, uh, can be anyone. Um, but they engage in, it's a form of active and collaborative learning, uh, or they can learn in organizations and clubs, but, and in many cultures, uh, somewhat different from our own Native American culture, for example, where learning is a communal activity, and where Native American students find it more challenging to learn under the conventions and traditions uh, and customs of a, of a white society when they were raised in more communal groups. Uh, and I'll never forget the, the expression, the African American African expression, I believe, in, in this country. You've heard it before that it takes a takes a whole village to raise a child. <clears throat> Finally, these experiences happen almost any time. Sometimes they can be planned and structured. Other times they're serendipitous. Sometimes students learn in spite of us, uh, as well as because of us. But at the least, we might be able to provide those occasions those settings that provide the opportunity for these things to happen. The actual occurrence of it may or may not be our doing, but we've at least sown the seed. We've at least tilled the field. And what happens after that, other people may have to take some responsibility for. Uh, the second is the search for best practices. Um, I don't want to suggest that we sh should stop doing that. Uh, but I, I want to suggest that I think best practices are best uh, because they have one or more of those six characteristics uh, that underlie, that I think underlie effective educational practices. Uh, but the fact that something works on one campus doesn't necessarily mean it'll work somewhere else. Transplants, like human transplants, may be un are probably unlikely to be fully successful somewhere else. Take a, take a program or an idea or a function and move from campus A to campus B. Maybe a great practice on A, it'll be a good practice on B, but probably not as spectacular as A. 
Organizations like human bodies have immune systems at work. Uh, there are organizational antibodies that work, some of which include things like the kinds of students, differences in the students on different campuses, differences in the organizational culture and what values, differences in the institutions, the organization's readiness to change, uh, differences in the necessary resources and the availability of resources, uh, differences in the leadership. Is there a champion for the idea on campus B as there is on campus A. And there may be differences in the institutional priorities uh, that will militate against the successful transplant of one practice from one to another. So my, my quarrel, if that's the right word, with best practices is that the search for them tends to narrow our vision rather than to expand it. We tend to look for the silver bullets and there aren't any. There aren't any. The, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. The moral of the story, and I had to write this down because I can't say it without reading it. <clears throat> but what an institution does, what particular activity or program or, or intervention, what an institution does is probably less important to, a, to student learning and development than Whatever an institution does has one or more of those six characteristics about it. So you can think of those six characteristics, use them as a touchstone, and look at, if you want to know whether a program is effective, one way to at least begin to get at that question would be to ask to what extent does this program or this activity or this, or this uh, intervention reflect or contain or practice lead to one of those six characteristics. Now, if you can get one, that's great. If you get two, so much the better. The more, the better. But if you find a program or a service or something and you can't find any of the six in there, there's a message. Obviously, there's a message. And as my friend George Crew has said, there are many roads to becoming an educationally engaging institution. We don't have to be carbon copies of one another. We can get to the same place with different riders, different students, different routes that we can take uh, to get where we all, all want to go. Now, uh, excuse me a second. If you look at the relationship or the impact of size, selectivity, wealth, student-faculty ratios, size of the library, um, activity of the alumni, you take, you take your pick on the tip, any of the typical indicators or markers of so-called institutional quality. Once you compare or once you control for the, the characteristics that students bring with them to college, once you take into account the clientele that a campus serves, those institutional differences, those traditional markers of quality, are virtually useless in predicting differences among institutions in how much students learn or change. There's one or two exceptions, and the most obvious exception is uh, in terms of educational, e or, I'm sorry, not education, but in terms of economic outcomes. Very elite, and it, it has to do largely with selectivity. The highly selective institutions, graduates of those institutions, tend to begin work at higher salaries and higher status positions. Net of the characteristics the students bring with them to college. But beyond, and I the suggestion here, the sociologists will tell you, is it's, it's a credentialing effect. You know, the, the society gives certain kinds of college the, the imprimatur to confer status and high quality. The recruiters look for and you know the institutions I'm talking about. Some of them are in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, there's also one in Central Pennsylvania, but it's a lucky one. Forgive me for saying that. Um, but it's what happens after students go there that make a difference in what the educate what makes for an educationally effective institution. It's what we do that matters. 
And I joked uh, earlier this morning uh, with a student affairs group that some of this evidence might lead me to suggest that you know the high the, the institutions that produce the high achieving, highly motivated, goal oriented, competent, skilled graduates um, also tend to be the institutions that enroll highly motivated, highly skilled, or goal oriented, uh, high flying students. But again, once you take into account the characteristics of the students themselves, the differences change. And some of those elite institutions don't measure up uh, quite so favorably against other um, less prestigious institutions. And one could, and I wouldn't say this, but one could suggest that maybe institutions should recognize the accomplishments of the admissions staff for locating and admitting these students. Uh, and for the faculty uh, in preparing them for commencement and beyond. And that, but at least we could say, of course, that probably the faculty at least have done no harm. Um, but I wouldn't say that. Uh, don't call me on that. Uh, that's just where the evidence might lead to uh, some smart, smart alec who wanted to get a better presentation. Bob Reason and I started to wonder, well, if those major markers are not a difference, of, or don't explain differences in institutional effects, what might? Then we thought, well, maybe it's not what these institutions are that matters, but what they do. And if we look at this model of the effects of college on students, this is, this is the traditional one where Students come in with certain kinds of characteristics, various sorts, and they go out performing at certain uh, levels on any of a number of uh, learning or developmental outcomes. And we do know, and it's fairly clear, that the primary influences on that are the students' experiences themselves. Policies about class sizes, uh, particularly for first-year students. Policies about who teaches first-year students. Some campuses, it's the high-flying faculty members, and it's a mark of honor to be invited to teach a first-year class. In other campuses, the high-flying faculty members, if an undergraduate student sees one, it may not be until the third or fourth year. Um, the academic and co-curricular programs, is there a common philosophy that undergirds the activities of a campus? Uh, that recognizes the interconnectedness of experiences and how students learn. Uh, the pedagogies in use, are they collaborative, coordinated, is there some form of integration? The faculty culture, who do we recruit as faculty members? What are the criteria and what are the standards by which we make decisions about who will be admitted to the faculty and who won't? And as someone said, it's a lot easier to hire a really good teacher than it is to, to retool a mediocre or a poor teacher. But do we ask the same thing of candidates for faculty positions? Do we ask the same questions, ask them to produce <coughs> the same evidence on their skills as we do about their research skills? There may be, there may be cases where we expect a new faculty member to make a presentation to the faculty and to the graduate students. Do we also ask those individuals to teach an undergraduate course for a day? Well, and I think in many cases the answer is not. What gets re rewarded, of course, not only who do we hire, but what kinds of activities and behaviors do we reward, whether for promotion and tenure or for uh, salary merit increases, um, otherwise. Do we reward faculty members who contribute to the ethos and the zeitgeist of the community that we're trying to create? Or do we say, nice job, give them a plaque, and you know, get back to work um, without any base, any adjustment in base salary, for example? Well, what are some of the take-homes um, for action here? The first I want to suggest is that we somehow find ways to align more carefully and closely what we do with what we know. Um, and believe me, there are stunning gaps uh, exist. And if we organized, we organized ourselves as institutions, um, 
and develop programs based on what we know about how college affects students, I think we would be building institutions that look quite different from the ones we have, ones we have today. The dominant philosophy is in higher education, I think, is shifting from a conception of teaching as delivery, I pitch, you catch, what I'm doing right now, to teaching um, as, as, a facili as facilitating learning, helping students to maximize their own chances of learning. Uh, moving from, uh, uh, well, one of my favorite quotes from William Butler Yeats is that education is not the filling of a pail, P-A-I-L. Education is not the filling of a pail, it is the lighting of a fire. It is not the filling of a pail, the lighting of a fire. And uh, in terms of decision making, if we can move from budgetary driven, and I'm not naive enough to suggest that we can forget about budgets, but at least perhaps somewhere along the line, the line, the question will get asked, how will the decision that we make in this situation, how will the alternative that we choose to follow, what effect will it have on the conditions for student learning and the campus? What will the impact be on students and on student learning? Finances and resources shouldn't be the sole driver. They have to be continued and are, are considered. There's no question about that. But at least let us not ignore the, the educational and the learning impact of some of the decisions that we make. Secondly, uh, we've known for some time that students out of class experiences have positive effects on persistence and on various and multiple forms of learning, including cognitive and cognitive development and intellectual skill development. I think we have to recognize and capitalize on that knowledge and find better and more ways to promote student learning and development through what happens outside the classroom as well as what happens inside. And I would point back to what I think is one of the prime examples of that uh, is service learning. Uh, there's really a nice, a nice mix of action and, and, and learning in, in uh, service of the common goal. We need to find ways to link people uh, among themselves, to need to link across curricula, across programs and services, across organizational structures, and linkages between students' uh, academic progress and their out-of-class uh, out experiences. Uh, by focusing, for starters, on students' first-year experiences, we in fact lay a foundation uh, for their success in subsequent years. Because nothing, as we all know, nothing succeeds quite like success. Really just a quick and simple question. Um, uh, how are <laughs> outcomes you had um, the word persistence? And I'm just wondering if you could explain that a little bit. Um, Cliff Edelman would say persistence is something that students do. Retention is something that institutions do. Uh, and persistence reminds me that the research is usually persistence from the start of first year to start of second year. There are some studies that look at it over longer periods of time, but essentially that term so means we have about uh, a continuation of efforts. Not necessarily uninterrupted, but when there's a break in, in, in the process, the evidence suggests so the likelihood that the student will persist longer or complete a degree in the end is reduced, and sometimes significantly. Uh, interrupt, interrupted enrollment is one of the uh, risk factors, their phrase, of the National Center for Education Statistics. Uh, what are some areas that you've seen in your experience that that really uh, is true and can work? Faculty are involved in it, and where the metaphor, again, is blurring the boundaries, uh, 
students oftentimes don't see the separation that, that we see between in and out of class or between faculty and non-faculty. Uh, but those living learning experiences, all, uh, living learning centers, very popular in the, in the 70s. Um, some at Michigan State, uh, I'm trying to remember where else, there were real successes with these communities. Um, I'm drawing a blank right now, but the evidence is pretty, pretty consistent that they were, they were pretty powerful uh, li learning, living and learning environments as they were intended to be. They were also um, resource intensive, uh, young faculty members found that they weren't being rewarded for those kinds of activities and they weren't able to pursue a more active research program uh, that was going to get them promotion and tenure and uh, more senior faculty tended to uh, not disparage but at least didn't find much merit in contributing to those activities. But they worked. You can find, if we can find other mechanisms and uh, paired courses, uh, joint courses, where students take multiple related courses together is uh, sort of a more, more recent uh, uh, resurrection of that idea. And you will hear references to, to learning communities. More often than not, it's, it doesn't have a residential component to it, but it's, it's doable in other ways. Uh, service learning is pretty, is pretty clearly one of those cases where um, I think student affairs staff and, and faculty can work together. But, the, but where it happens, how it happens, the first consideration is, are there going to be mutual benefits to it? You know, is everybody going to get something that's important to them and something that will be satisfying to them? And if that, uh, if that quid, pro quo, quid pro quo from one side, whichever, to the other and back, if that's not there, uh, it's a fool's game. Um, every bit, each, each party is wasting time, and wasting, wasting their own and wasting the others. In some cases, they can, they can be confident. People may get into them in, in the spirit of collaboration and find out that it's not well planned, it's not carefully planned. The payoff is not equal to what had been promised. The delivery, uh, the, the delivery slipped up somehow. Other areas may be in internships, um, off-campus employment that, that doesn't, don't get burdensome, that may support students' financial needs, but more importantly, put them in real-world settings where if, if the internship, if a faculty member's involvement in the internship is something more than just sitting down at the end of the term and having a conversation about well, how to go, but if, if there's a more frequent and common exchange of faculty with the, with the intern, and the intern with the employer, and the employer with the faculty member, if it gets a little more structured, a little more organized, a little more, a little more pur purposeful, and everybody knows what the outcomes uh, should be, then the likelihood that it's going to be successful uh, goes up. A lack of ability or willingness, perhaps, to invest the time to think about these things and to ask questions that nobody's asked before. Some of them may be off the wall. That's okay. But maybe a question somebody asks will spark an idea in somebody else. Um, but I think we have to be more risk takers. Uh, and we also have to be, frankly, more political. And I don't use that term uh, pejoratively. We have to understand, I mean, my, my mantra this morning was the, you know, Kenny Rogers, the gambler. If you're going to play the game, boy, you got to you better learn to play it right in order to get what you think is important. What are the deal breakers? You're going to have to stand, you're going to have to protect those. Otherwise, you know, there won't be a bargain, there won't be an agreement. But what are you willing to give up in order to, to get one of those deal breakers to your satisfaction? What are you willing to give? in exchange what you're asking uh, another to give. Well, what do you see as implications or suggestions for graduate and professional programs out of this research? Good undergraduate honors programs. Or you look at doctoral education, you will see most of these characteristics, active involvement with faculty, students working together in groups on projects, 
graduate assistants working as research assistants on, on a research project and the mentoring that's going on. The problem is to take some of those circumstances, some of those situations and relationships, and can we, can we ramp them up somehow to include more students? I, I, I'm gracious, I said nothing about undergraduate research programs, for example. Um, very powerful experiences. There's an emerging body of literature to, to support that claim. It's not yeah, this is going to be the classic long preamble, but I promise there will be a question at the end. <laughs> so, um, one of your slides you talked about the different influences, positive and negative, and you listed intercollegiate athletics when they're revenue producing as a negative, and I think that's fairly well documented and fairly well understood. Anecdotally, from my background, I spent a number of years at University Athletic Association schools, and at those schools, Typically, the athletic athletes have a higher grade point average than the student body, and they have a higher grade point average in season than out of season. And also, they, the uh, the outcomes you want for students are produced in on the playing field and and through the, through the teams. And I would also suggest that the uh, those six things you, you want the departments to do, the athletic department is is probably the good place to start on campus to see someone who's actually doing those things. So the question then comes, is in this research, if you didn't talk about the non-revenue producing sports, does the research, research support anything that I just said? Uh, yes, I believe it does. Uh, one of the important findings in the studies about revenue producing sports, my, when, I, when I first saw the evidence on that, my first thought was, aha, uh, we got the division one, you know, it turns out that that relationship, that the slopes, if you will, the, the learning curves are somewhat, more, are somewhat flatter among male athletes now, not, not women athletes, but male athletes in, in football and basketball, essentially. The learning slopes are a little bit flatter. That relationship holds regardless of the division. It's true at Division II schools, it's, it's true at Division III. It's not a big money uh, sport issue. I think there's something else at work, and I think it has to do with the culture that develops within athletic teams and within fraternities. It doesn't also work at sororities. The evidence is far less clear on that. But my, my speculation, and it is speculation, is that those cultures may tend to, to insulate and to isolate more than to expand. And there are certain, you know, there's a certain gathering of the wagons, we're all in this together, and if you're going to be a member of this group, you behave in certain ways, and you put in certain amounts of time in these activities and those activities, and that if you do that, you restrict the opportuni opportunities to encounter the different. In fact, the effects of uh, study abroad programs is a, uh, it's a very weak area in terms of the rigor of the research to support the claims. But uh, my own experience, you know, in N of 1, my own experience with travel is that it's a, it's a mind-stretching, a mind-expanding experience. You see that there are other ways to accomplish the same things. There are different beliefs about the world and the way it is. There are different beliefs about supreme beings. It's a wonderfully enriching. Uh, there are other ways to structure your government. There are other ways to pay for your health care. Uh, there are countries who have managed uh, to minimize poverty. Uh, all of these things. And the, and the other interesting thing is we, we also, begin, if we're paying attention, I think, begin to find or understand that Hey, you know, we're different in a lot of ways, but in some other fundamental ways, we're not so different after all. And we may approach, we may try to, to you know, take care of our children or, or enrich our own lives in certain ways that one to, below the surface are fairly common across, across uh, nations. Now, one thing, if I may, while I'm right here, I want to apologize to Pittsburgh and say hello uh, for coming tonight. I didn't, I didn't 